Hello everyone, it's Abdullah here and we're going to be covering in this video a gallbladder cancer. So you have a patient who underwent a cool bladder, uh, who has gallbladder cool cancer and underwent open cholecystectomy. And they developed surgical site infection and necrotizing fasciitis as well and complicated by poly, uh, pseudomembranous colitis. Okay, so we're going to cover all the three topics as you can see from this one. So surgical site infection at the beginning and necrotizing fasciitis and pseudomembranous colitis, and also we're going to talk very quickly about gallbladder cancer. So I think we talked in the anatomy about where the gallbladder is and its relation and everything. So this is the cystic duct and this is the gallbladder, as you can see that. I mean, the cystic duct is not that short, but let's assume. And also, for the types of cancer, if this is the gallbladder wall, as you see in here, you will have two different types of cancer that can arise in this wall. There is something called an exophytic uh, gallbladder cancer, which will basically grow inside the wall is like that, and infiltrating, which will start infiltrating the wall instead of the lumen. All right. So these are the two uh, basic types of uh, or pathological types of gallbladder cancer. But the question initially is, what are the basic or the risk factors for gallbladder cancer? So we talked before about the adenoma carcinoma sequence in many different. Uh, 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 pathologies. So to be the same here, so if you have patient with clodocolithiasis or some sort of uh, gallbladder stones that are present in here, can cause chronic irritation to the wall and this can lead to metaplasia with time. Also, um, uh, the primary sclerosis and cholangitis uh, in females can be a risk of gallbladder cancer as well and some carcinogens that are derived from the bile Assets, bile acids, carcinogens. So, in terms of the relation of the gallbladder, so you will have on the top the liver will be here, and you will have the stomach very close as well, and you'll have the duodenum, and you have some sort of lymph nodes in this area, and the porta hepatis as well. So, all of these areas represent site of metastasis, of direct metastasis of gallbladder cancer. We talked about the two patterns, like we said the exophytic and infiltrating type. So if this is the wall of the gallbladder, for example, like that, if that's the wall, and you will have uh, two different types. The one is infiltrating, the one is exophytic type, which would be sort of like this, and the other one is infiltrating type, which is in uh, intervening with the wall rather than the lumen, All right? So as you can see from the description, this one is cauliflower, and can be ulcerating as well. Cauliflower that looks like a cauliflower, basically. Types, most of the times, it's adenocarcinoma, and here we're talking about the histological type. However, it could be squamous cell carcinoma or adenosquamous cell carcinoma as well. The patient develops surgical site infection, and here we're coming to this. So, um, it, so the scenario, how the scenario works, the patient has surgical site infection, and you started them on IV antibiotic to treat that. But one of the possible complications of having patients on IV antibiotic for a prolonged time is to develop bloody diarrhea due to pseudomembranous colitis as well, which we're gonna cover in the next video. So surgical side infection, post-orbital day three, and it has yellowish discharge, that is possibly an actinomyces, all right, which, which are the sulfur granules. The commonest organism ever for all surgical site infection is a staph aureus, and the organism causing necrotizing fasciitis could be a beta homolytic streptococci or a staph aureus or clostridium perfungens. But what is necrotizing fasciitis? From the name, it's necrosis, extensive necrosis to the fascia of mostly the lower limb or any fascia in the body, but mostly the lower limb. Okay, so this is necrotizing fasciitis, characterized by it's some sort of a very extensive type of cellulitis. But cellulitis is the dermis and the epidermis, as you know, but this one is for the fascia. It can be caused by all of these organisms, the streptococci, the staph aureus, the clostridium perfringens, bacteroids, and the MSRA as well. All right, so these are the uh, necrotizing fasciitis definition and the causes as well, all right? So how would the patient pre present? 
So the patient will typically present by sepsis, very septic as well, quite severe sepsis, or might even be in a septic shock. So the sepsis, obviously we're talking all the parameters of the news two score. So you will have the fever as a temperature, the blood pressure, you're taking low blood pressure, the heart rate will be high, the respiratory rate will be high, and also the urine output will be low, in addition to altered mental status or confusion as well, even saturation might be low as well. When you go to examine the patient locally, the characteristics of uh, necrotizing fasciitis is that you will find a change in the color of the lower limb and a change in the function and some sort of presence of crepitation when you start to press on it. In the lab, it is extensive sepsis. You will have increased white blood cells, increased CRP, and deranged liver function. We talked about the pathology. It's an extensive necrosis and thrombosis of the blood vessels supplying the fascia. The management will need to do A to E approach and surgical deprivement on the starting your patient an antibiotic. We need to admit this patient to ICU and also plastic surgeons to join us for the treatment. Bloody diarrhea is, um, is, is a continuation to the previous scenario of having uh, the patient been an antibiotic, IV antibiotic for a long time, and they presented with bloody diarrhea. What are the causes of bloody diarrhea in this patient? As a first instance, with the patient being an antibiotic, we need to think about the C. diff infection and developing pseudomembranous colitis. However, they might have an ulcer, they might have bowel ischemia, and they might have infective gastroenteritis as well. So these are our differentials, but mainly clostridium difficile is the main differential. So pseudomembranous colitis is one of those organisms or the bacteria flora that is bound in the, ab in the inside the abdomen. So the antibiotic therapy normally disrupt all the flora and allow the C. diff to colonize and to grow inside the abdomen. And then this organism will release toxins that will disrupt the epithelial function in the wall and associated by a significant inflammatory response. And it's also characterized by volcano-like eruption of neutrophils. So if you see at this diagram, so step one, you have the spores and the patient will normally have this already, but the microbiota or the flora are protecting us. When you take a large amount of antibiotic, these flora will die and the C. diff will start to colonize in the bowel and it will start to invade the wall or their toxins basically will start to invade the wall and cause significant inflammation to the wall and even can cause perforation on a later stage. The toxin is PNA produced and damaged the pseudomembrane and lead to pseudomembrane colitis and the reason why we call it pseudomember, there is something like a membrane that is formed on the wall of the mucosa, and it's quite a significant issue. Usually they are managed under medics, uh, but if they had any sort of perforation or acute abdomen, they'll be admitted under the surgeons as well. Thank you.